محمد سيد طابت مناقبه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم في الدائم بعض بنافس من الناسفه إن شاء الله تعالى I'm just going to give a basic overview of the religion of Islam إن شاء الله تعالى my dear and beloved who besides me إن شاء الله will expand upon in various aspects of what is presented. And it was a work which is a very influential work that sort of does sort of dictate the world in which we live in, the age in which we live in, which is called um, The End of History and the Last Man. It was written by Francis Fukuyama, who used to be one of the sort of you know, chief thinkers in the Rand Corporation in America. And in that work, The End of History and the Last Man, he spoke about the religion of Islam. Because no doubt the religion of Islam is topical in our age, but unfortunately there's not many people who understand what does Islam actually stand for and what are the essential teachings of Islam. And one of the things that Fukuyama we mentioned of in his work was that the beauty of Islam is that it speaks to man as man. And he saw that as the ultimate power of the religion. And what he meant by it, and he explains that, that it speaks to man as man, that it moves beyond like race. It moves beyond culture. It moves beyond a lot of the superficial things that ultimately define human beings, you know, for better or for worse. And so that there is, from our perspective, that he hits the sort of nail upon the head as it relates to Islam. And so Islam, no doubt, is a religion that revolves around the essential and the natural way of the human being. That's why often they call Islam the, the way of nature, they call it the religion of nature, the natural way. In the Arabic language, deen al-fitrah. And if, when we define the human being, we can define the human being as has traditionally been defined from antiquity. The human being is a creature that has multiple uh, dimensions. So the human being, we often hear the term mind, body, and soul, for an example. And so the religion of Islam is about the regulation of the mind, the body, as well as the soul. Remember the term Islam, it means to go into a state of submission and surrender. And so Islam is about submitting the mind, it is about submitting the soul, it's about submitting the body, the physics of the human being. Okay? There are going to be terms that are going to be adopted in that regard, in our religion. And so we speak about the submission of the human body. That is literally what we would call Islam. So Islam is a submission of the physics. When we speak about the submission of the human mind, that is a term that we call Iman. It's akin to faith, faith. And then when we speak about the submission of the human soul, which is the essence, the reality of the human being, that in the Arabic language, it's a term which is Ihsan. And that there, that Ihsan, that is the objective of the religion of Islam. Then the scholars of this great religion, they will speak about faith and law. And we're going to translate terms now. So Islam, we could maybe speak about it being law. Iman, we could speak about it being faith. He's saying these two are means towards an objective. Okay, they're not the objective in and of itself. So the objective of the religion is not law. Law is a means towards an objective. The objective of the religion is not faith, but faith is a means towards the attainment of an objective. What is the objective? It's what's called Ihsan. And the term Ihsan in the Arabic language ultimately is about beauty espoused. It's about how beauty becomes what we call transitive. It's not only something that, what, that is inside of the human being, but by virtue of it being in the human being, it begins to affect the entire environment that is around the human being. That's the objective of this, that's what's called the Deen of Ihsan. And that all relates to the essence of the human being, which is a spiritual essence. One of the great poets, he says, عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْرُوحِ فَاسْتَكْمِلْ فَضَائِلَهَا فَأَنْتَ بِالْرُوحِ لَا بِالْجَسَدِ إِنْسَانِ He said, take care of your soul, perfect its virtues because by virtue of the soul not by virtue of the form are you defined as a human being I we are defined as human by our spiritual potential not by virtue of our physical capacity okay the human being has to yeah, um, 
rise to the calling of God in that regard, physically, spiritually, and mentally. And that rising to the calling of God requires struggle. I need to submit to God, there has to be a struggle. And that's where we see a term which has been misappropriated inside of our day and age, which is the term in Arabic, three letters, Jim ha dal. So you're gonna hear this term jihad. Often hear this term jihad. And so we need to sort of understand what does the term jihad mean? And so jihad in the in the religion of Islam, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said, Vir what is sinam. That it is the uppermost part. What do you mean the uppermost part? It is the root, the very fabric of the religion of God, jihad. But the problem is when you won't misunderstand what the term is. And so the term jihad in the Arabic language, it means struggle. It is how we submit. It's how we regulate ourselves. And so if we look at the religion, when the physics of the human being, the body of the human being surrenders to God, it must undergo literally the term jihad. So jihad is about a physical submission. Yeah. If people understand the language of the Semites, the language of the Semites, when you're, whether you're dealing with Arabic, whether you're dealing with Hebrew, whether you're dealing with Aramaic, Amharic, all those languages, they can usually be based on what we call triliteral roots, three letters. So I put it into English, a J, a H, and a D. That's, so jihad has these three letters. It's very, very important. From it, multiple sort of linguistic terms will come forth. And so the jim, a ha, and a da. And so when we speak about physical struggle, in order to ensure that our want is aligned with the want of God, that's what you call jihad. Yeah. When it's about the mental struggle, about how I submit my mind to God, it's still a jim ha adal, but they express it with ijtihad. Now that we call it ijtihad. Ijtihad is like an internalization of the physical. That's what I mean, like an internalization, it's an internal struggle. It's a mental struggle that the human being must undergo in order to ensure that he sees the world as it should be seen, as it is in reality, not as he ultimately perceives it to be. And then the third element of it is what's called mujahada. And mujahada is that spiritual struggle. It's still the jihadah, it's still the jihad, but in Arabic they call it mujahada, and it's how we exert ourselves spiritually to ensure that the spiritual want of God for the human being is the spiritual want of the human being for themselves. That's sort of Islam in a nutshell, inshallah ta'ala, and I'm sure inshallah ta'ala things will be expanded upon. <coughs> May God's peace, meaning security, granted from all harm by the author of peace be granted to all of you, as well as God's mercy, which is his will and good, all types of good and beneficence, as well as his blessings, which means uh, an, uh, a, uh, an uh, imperceptible good and increase and multiplication. And we begin in the name of God, most merciful and compassionate. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And we praise God, the Lord of all beings and creatures. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak wa karam ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa alihi wa sahbihi wa jumeer al akhwanihi min al anbiya'i wa mursaleen wa alayna ma'ahum wa fihim bi rahmatika ya rahmanir rahimin. And we invoke God's blessings as well as mercy and peace from him upon our master Muhammad and his family and companions as well as all of his brothers and forefathers of the prophets and their families and companions and we ask God that these blessings be upon all of us who are present with them and among them by God's mercy and he's the most merciful of the merciful. It's a pleasure to meet you all. This is one of the smaller audiences we'll address, but I consider it one of the more important audiences. And, um, and alhamdulillah. And I actually came up with a title uh, for what I'm going to say. We're traveling around from city to city, hotel room, hotel room, uh, and we briefly prepared. Um, we briefly prepared, hopefully, our lives and our, ourselves, our preparation. Um, and the uncle who introduced, he mentioned uh, that um, the Muslims, we encourage the young Muslims 
um, to get to know other people. Um, however, I want to cross out other, if I may, uh, and to say that we, the Muslims, are all people. We're all people. Um, you know, I'm a convert to Islam. I embraced Islam. Some people say revert. Um, ethnically, um, my origin is between uh, African American, Native American, and British Canadian. I'm sitting next to my one of my dearest brothers and closest confidants, uh, Sheikh Yahya Rodas, who's ethnically what we would call European American, as he mentioned from uh, Missouri and Kansas, which is essentially the gateway between the North and the South. Mm -hmm. It's the gateway between the North and the South, and all of you who watch the news knows what's going on in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, and I grew up in, the, in, the, in the, the home of the Black Panthers, the Black Panther Party, a black nationalist organization, and that, that type of thinking shaped, that type of thought and movement shaped a lot of my emotions and feelings. But that doesn't stop me after getting to know Prophet Muhammad sallam, for holding a white American brother as one of my dearest, closest, most beloved confidants. And alhamdulillah, he wrote that me. Praise be to God, the Lord of all beings. So to meet you all, it's a blessing. To meet people from, frankly, a nation who's in conflict with members of my faith community, what I believe, people may not believe this, from extreme, irrational, uh, greedy, aggressive elements of both of those two uh, populations, for me to be people like that as a human with other humans and talk about what I love and my concerns and hear uh, from them of their concerns, that's one of the most important things I'll do while I'm here in the British Isles. And I love um, visiting the Muslim communities. I love hearing the Shi in Arabic and in Tur Turkish and in, uh, in Urdu hearing not. And I love biryani and all these things. But I don't, you know, I didn't leave the, the most dearest of the mystics on the surface of this earth to me to wander the earth and just talk to other Muslims who have been Muslims for centuries, but to meet other people because that's what I believe my prophet was sent to do. And, um, our Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, he was described as a mercy to all beings. We didn't send you except as a mercy to all beings. And an alam in Arabic, it is uh, everything other than God, all of the creation, the universe. Um, and it comes from uh, the word alam, which is like a sign. All of this universe is a sign of its creator. But when you make it a plural, that's a plural that resembles uh, plurals that are used for humans, you say alamin, all beings you would translate that as. So not only was this prophet a mercy to all humans, he's a mercy to all beings among the various dimensions of Allah's creation, of God's creation. He's a mercy to angels. He's a mercy to the jinn. As uh, Sidi Nadir alluded to in his nasheed, he wasn't only sent to mankind and the jinn and angels, creatures that have a, a ruh, which are the essence, a spirit, which are the essence of the alam, he was also sent to rocks and stones. And um, as he mentioned, with the stones, and with and in the verses that were recited in the Quran, and they should be translated. Really, um, it's imperative that we translate when we address English-speaking audiences. Allah said, uh, God said, the um, trees and stars prostrate. That even uh, the worshiper of God, the one who surrenders to God in Islam, the messenger of God, he was sent not just to terrestrial beings and creatures, he was sent to celestial creatures. Not just man, but to spirits. Not just uh, spirits, but, but to inanimate objects. Not just inanimate objects, but to plants. And uh, he was sent to all. And he said, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically, God spoke of him specifically to humans, and he said uh, that he sent, we did not send you save to humanity in its entirety. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sent to humanity in its entirety. In prophetic tradition, he said, more specifically, mentioning some of the distinctions of the message that he was given, um, a prophet previously used to be sent to his specific people. And I was sent to humanity in its entirety. Bu'ithtu linnasi kafa. And in another version of that prophetic tradition, he said, I was sent to the creation in its entirety. And what message did he bring to all of humanity or all of the creation? Um, 
as uh, Sheikh Ibrahim mentioned, Allah, that uh, this ihsan is like a transitive beauty, a beauty that exists between the servant and his master or his Lord, God, the divine, uh, that then translates outside of them and extends to others. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, one of uh, God's beautiful names and attributes is Ar-Rahman, that he is the most merciful, the one whose mercy envelops uh, all of his creation. His will of good envelops all of his creation in this world and the next. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is one of those beautiful manifestations of God's attribute, or that beautiful manifestation of God's attributes that then extends to the rest of the creation. So the message he brought to all of humanity, and he said this speaking for all of human to all of humanity, sometimes he'll speak specifically to the believers, um, and God will speak specifically to the believers in the Quran, but sometimes Prophet Muhammad speaks to all of humanity, as does the divine in the Quran. So he said, Ayyuhannas, O humanity, verily I am only a gift of mercy. I am only a gift of mercy. So he's a gift of mercy that's universal, you know. So if we understand that, and, and specifically I address this to my Muslim brothers and sisters in the city, um, we have to uh, not see people as other, and particularly in our faith community, and I actually uh, take some exception to that, because our faith is not certain ethnicities or certain traditions. Our faith is, uh, is a, and our Prophet وسلم, is a gift from the divine that's a mercy to all, and, and numerous uh, nations and ethnicities and cultures have embraced this, and in a sense, it took them to what uh, Sheikh Ibrahim noted, it took them there to their essential humanity. Um, and then for us in this phase uh, of, of uh, the history of the world, um, we really have to uh, connect with each other. So we're happy to be with you, uh, we're happy to sit with you, and, and, uh, and we are, you know, we have understood that there's local officials, maybe even police, and if I could just end with an anecdote that I hope isn't offensive, but like, uh, as an African American young man growing up in the United States, like your enemy is the police. Uh, you may not understand that, but just just take my word for it. And if you watch the uh, if you watch the news, understand that. Um, you know, and uh, there's epithets even that are used for police. But uh, one of the things one of the things that this universal prophet's message taught uh, this needy servant of yours, your brother Abdul Karim, uh, when we met scholars that transmitted it, as we mentioned in this mercy was that I'm just as happy to meet a police officer as I'm happy to meet anyone on the surface of the earth. And if I meet them, my goal is what? Just to introduce them to this beautiful Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu um, And what we understood is that is the best security from any harm that either side would do uh, to one another um, is that you know people, again, connect to what's essential in our humanity and essential in uh, God's message to humanity. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. And we ask um, that God send peace and uh, blessings to the Prophet Muhammad, as well as his brothers and uh, forefathers from the Prophets, their families um, and their companions, and upon us. And praise be to God, the Lord of all beings. Excuse me. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, and the peace and blessings of God be upon the Prophet Muhammad and all of the other prophets and messengers. I would like to first of all reiterate the sentiments that were expressed. Um, this is a very important gathering that I place great value in. And I really believe that in small settings like this, where we can come together in a comfortable space, that we have opportunities to get beyond that many of these barriers and that oftentimes misconceptions that are sometimes rooted in baseless supposition where we can really start to recognize which is for many people a human ideal or rational ideal which for Muslims is a Quranic ideal and that God says in the Quran وَجَعْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُ that we have made you of different origins, of tribal origins, that of family origins, but the purpose of all of that, and this is what's known in the Arabic language, the lam ta'lil, the purpose of us all having different backgrounds is li is that we come to know one another, and the whole purpose of coming to know one another as that the commentators on the Quran say, the exegetes, is li is li so that we can come to mutually 
that perfect one another, that we can mutually benefit one another. And if I may add, we're giving the organizers a hard time today, an additional corrective, that to me that coexistence is a very low bar to set. Coexistence is a very, very low bar to set. Um, that should be a given. That's a part of being a human being, is coexisting. Anything less than that is barbarism and there's a lack of humanity. So to me, I'm, I'm not interested in much as coexistence. Can me that's already something that's a given? I'm interested in something beyond coexistence, which is that you know, making contributions and mutual benefit that comes from that civilizational discourse and that interacting with people from different backgrounds. And I think there's a lot of fruits that come and that the whole study of this, the interaction between civilizations as a historical matter, is a topic in and of itself. So I do believe that these are very important opportunities that we all have, even though our time is short. And I would also like to say that our presentation here as a way of beginning is really important. Because oftentimes we jump right into specific questions, but we don't have the context to understand those questions. And unfortunately that we live in an age of sound bites and we live in an age where you have a 30 minute news segment, but if you read a book like Neil Postman's How to Watch TV News that you recognize is that it's not even 30 minutes if you add in all the commercials and then the way that very complicated nuanced issues are presented in very short periods of time that are done so in a way that is oftentimes that not palatable. In other words, that we can't fully develop a real perspective on that unless that we actually would read a lot about the background leading up to these circumstances so that we can really have an informed opinion. So it is important that we understand the proper context for any questions that will come about in the Q&A. I would like to add one additional dimension to everything that was already mentioned about the faith of Islam and it's the importance of what you could call orientation and that as a result of orientation, grounding. That Islam teaches us how to be oriented. That it orients us in relation to time, that it orients us in relation to place, and it orients us that in the internal degree as well, in dimension as well, in relation to the spirit. As for time, that Islam, there are a lot of teachings that put a whole context of the world in which we live, let's say that it's about, if scientists are correct, 14 billion years old, is that it puts this world in orients us what is this world all about in relation to the world that came before, in relationship to the other worlds that are to come. It orients us in relation to that all of existence, from the very beginning until the everlasting existence for faith-based people who believe in two final abodes. But it also orients us in relation to that the beginning of that life as we know it on earth and then whether we believe it according to science or whether we believe it according to a tradition. There's a book by Charles Upton titled Legends of the End where it's a part of every major religion that there is an idea of an end. All religious people had an idea of an end. And it orients us in relation to this world as we know it. And so what is the upshot of that and how Islam orients us in relation to time is that we have in a sense an ahistorical perspective defined as is that we see ourselves that in relation to the past, present, and in the future and just so happens for many of us that I'm a convert to Islam, that Abdul Karim's a convert to Islam, Ibrahim was born into Islam, some are living in the British Isles here in the United Kingdom, others are living in different places. Is that, but we have teachings that in a sense transcend history and, and thus in that sense that they're ahistorical. So what is the purpose of that then? It's to understand for a Muslim the depth of those teachings such that it leads to the second term that I use which is called grounding. And it's only when we properly orient ourselves, and I just mentioned briefly in terms of time, that it's also there's a dimension of space and a spiritual dimension which is probably a topic of another conversation is that in a sense that we are grounded in understanding these three dimensions, the primary dimensions of the religion, which are known in Arabic as Iman, Islam, and Ihsan, roughly translated as faith, practice, and spiritual excellence, or morality, ethics. And so that these three dimensions are what allow a Muslim to be grounded. And what we mean by ground is being grounded in principles. And this is something 
that is in no way in contradictory to any understanding of that Western philosophical thought in legal theory that led to that the democratic societies in which we live, and that it leads to what I think we should all be encouraged to do, which is principled integration, which leads to that contribution. And I think that this is really what it's about. And that first dimension, that principled, is as an adjective to describe the type of the integration that we're referring to that focuses on this dimension of being rooted in that faith, practice, and spiritual excellence. And it is from here there is an internal conversation that is consistently happening. We are on a tour right now, in fact, that this is the month of Rabi al-Awwal in Arabic, and this is the month that the Prophet Muhammad was born in. And we are on a tour touring, I think, nine different cities, or ten, and the idea behind this is to that bring a deep sense of love in the heart of Muslims and to rekindle that love for the Prophet Muhammad. Because that love is seen as that underlying essence that helps us. This is the very, very best way that we can ground ourselves in faith practice and spiritual excellence. And that the argument would be is it's to the degree that, that in any individual Muslim is not principled, i.e. grounded, will be to the degree that they ultimately do something, whether it be a way of, by way of mind, body, or soul, and air in one of two directions of excessiveness or remissiveness, remissness, that allows them to do something that would diverge from the true teachings of the Prophet. And that this is really what this is about, is to rekindle the spirit, and to, that when we talk about identity, the most important aspect of identity is that your spiritual identity is that we were all standing before God, according to Muslim belief, and that our essential identity is one that were you to strip every aspect of the human being, our skin color, our features, everything else that relates to us, cut off an arm or a leg or something of this nature, that your skin be burned, whatever might happen, something has to remain of you. And this essential identity that relates to what that Sheikh Ibrahim mentioned is our fitrah, this natural disposition of the human being is that this has to be nurtured. And that when it is nurtured in an environment that allows for proper growth, is that this will allow grounding to take place, and that it allows principal integration to then be the necessary result. And this is to me what is the greatest challenge of all, that internally speaking within the Muslim community, whether we be in the United States of America where I reside, or here, and in the Western world in general, wherever Muslims are a minority, is creating environments of education that are really grounding people in all of the true meanings of education, all the multi-dimensional meanings of education, and that encompassing all of the necessary needs of the human being to lead to proper health, whether it be at the level of the spirit, whether it be a level of the rational intellectual, whether it be a level of the mental, psychological, emotional, even physical, which leads to healthy social interactions that involve ultimately environmental interactions. All of these are dimensions of health, unfortunately, in the compartmentalized modern mind, is that you have to get all of these in different places, and it's very difficult to summarize them for people under one umbrella. But these are all essential part of teachings of the religion of Islam, and I will end with the following before we open up for the Q&A is that in this ahistorical dimension that we refer to, that I, I really believe that Islam has proven itself to be extremely flexible, that spanning that a vast number of areas over centuries. And there probably is arguably, <coughs> statistically, more Muslims living as minorities, and this has been the case historically, at least in recent history, then there are living under a quote unquote Islamic that state or that an Islamic that polity of some sort. And that one of the great proofs of that is, is that we tend to forget that even though the official numbers of Muslims in China are sometimes said to be about 30 million, that many other estimates hold it to be as close to as 100 million. That uh, how many Muslims do we have uh, in places like India? That how many Muslims do we have in many sub-Saharan sub African countries that are not that Muslim dominant countries, or at least politically speaking, that you have a long, drawn out history that for the most part was a very successful history of living as minorities, and this is ultimately rooted in the prophetic time himself, the Prophet Muhammad, 
that because of the persecution when they were in the early period, what is known as the Meccan period, is that the Prophet sent on more than one occasion a group of his companions to Abyssinia and to live there, that under the protection of a Christian king who was later became a Muslim, but at first is that they were being protected and that there was a protocol that they had when living in these particular places. Um, many of these also tend to, they do tend to be internal conversations, but uh, with that basis that this is something that I think that we all have to collectively that work towards. And to me, this really is about balance. Um, I come from a country that I really hope that in the House of Lords it's passed where Donald Trump is banned from entering to your country because I don't believe he's a good. This is a great testament of your government here that when they banned Pamela Geller and that uh, Daniel Pipes from entering to your country, that shows me that you have people that have scruples and that their that impetus for banning them was the fact that they, they weren't good for the society. I think there's a lot to be said. Unfortunately, we live in a time where they've proven that Islamophobia is tied to that elections, that when elections draw near, that this is the card that people like to pull to get elected. And the problem is, is that there's innocent, that people, and this could be my wife or daughter walking on the street, that are harmed by that as a result of these hate mongers and these Islamophobes, which I think we need to have more sense as human beings to see through a lot of this. And that ultimately extremes on both sides, right, are the problem. And this is one of the things I'm trying to remind my own people of, is that no one is playing more to the cards of these groups like ISIS than people like Donald Trump. And this is exactly what they want. And if we have sense in that we reject all extremes, that while recognizing our differences, is that I think that this could at least live to, lead to the best of possibilities as we share that the lands in which we live, and then hopefully that move beyond that to its one of contribution and mutual benefit. So thank you very much for inviting us, and I look forward to that your questions, and I guess we'll pass it back now to the organizers. Thank you very much uh, for that. We do have a <coughs> roving mic for uh, any question that you, uh, you may have. We'll bring the mic to you, and uh, our guests will answer your questions. Uh, who's got the first question? I'm sure there are lots of questions that you have, please. It's a great opportunity for us uh, to speak uh, and find out more about the religion of Islam uh, from our uh, three guest speakers. Gentlemen, I understand that there's a difference in view between the Sunni and Shia as regards the Quran, but I don't understand what that difference is. Could you give us some clue? going to be a lot of this, of, of trying to put questions on different people, um, uh, that, um, that there are, it is, it is by consensus of all Muslims, is that the Quran is the same Quran that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. This would require a detailed um, discussion of both the oral transmission with the written transmission that both of them were very much a part of the preservation of the Qur'an. The oral transmission precedes the written transmission. And although we do have very early copies uh, of the Qur'an uh, still with us, uh, there are certain fringe groups within the Shiite understanding that as a result of an opinion, a theological opinion that they had in relation to the Prophet's companions, did not consider them that upright such that some of them have questioned certain verses that are in the Qur'an. But that is by no means the dominant Shiite position. There are certain fringe groups within Shiism uh, that purport that, which is something that for that 99% of Muslims is, is something that is rejected. Thank you very much. Uh, as hmm? Yeah, you want the next question? Yeah. Um, I'm a great fan of uh, Habib, Sheikh Habib Al-Jifri. 
who has been to this great uh, academy a few years ago, and he spoke very eloquently. I'm really uh, very pleased to see some of his uh, people who are associated with him as well. Uh, Shiv, you mentioned about coexistence is given. Anything less than is barbaric. Um, I really want to dwell on this issue because that's the key message which we really want to dwell on uh, to our young people today. Uh, although that is taken for granted, but that is the message that we need to come across. So I really appreciate your advice to our young people, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, about coexistence in the true example today. You mentioned about making contribution, interaction with other faiths, but this is the really crux that we are really desperate to hear from you. Um, if I may, and again, I don't want you to think I'm avoiding your question, is that there are that this, there is a sense that every time that something happens, is that we have to that condemn it or have a stance on it or say something about it. And that if we were to do that in a globalized world, and we would use social media, all we would have on our posts is condemnations of everything that is happening. And that yes, that you might differentiate between major events and, well, could you even call it a minor event? In reality, is that if you stand for justice worldwide, is that just as we condemn that the shootings in San Bernardino, that we also have to condemn all other that unjust killings that took place, domestically in the United States of America, speaking of my context and abroad. I'm saying that to say that there is this sense that, you know, the work that I'm doing, that we're doing here, that to me, with mute eloquence, that it is providing a solution to these problems without even saying about it, speaking about it. There are people that, that want to speak about this, want to speak about this, want to speak about this. To me, that's important to let people know that theoretically that this is important, but more important than that to me is really doing the work, is really being on the ground, affecting people's lives, and then giving them a practical way to reconcile a lot of this. And so to me, that even when we're not explicitly talking about this with the youth, is that if you look at the educational programs that all of us are supporting and actively taking part in, that they are that reality played out in the very real lives of people. And I think that, that we need more of this and more time and that more support in doing this. And so to me, that you know, I don't really know what else to say. Yes, that we do speak about it theoretically at times, but to me the more important dimension of that is to keep working and actually to do, to do the work. Any other questions? Uh, come on, we got some young people at the back. I'm sure that you get lots of questions asked uh, to you by your peers, uh, by your friends. Uh, this is an opportunity and may, you may have found difficult to answer. Come on, let's have those questions here and ask our uh, scholars. wondering, uh, in this world of media sound bites, um, where it seems that things get skewed quite easily, um, do you think that there's some way or some traction um, around social media, hashtags for example, say you write no uh, Muslim bruv hashtag, um, seems to resonate quite a lot with me as a white British guy, uh, you know, sort of that heard that and thought, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, I don't know if you're aware of that hashtag. Could that you repeat it? I didn't catch it. That, what was it? You, it's, you ain't no Muslim, bruv. Oh. That was stated. Um, and I'm sorry if it's offensive um, to anybody, but um, but it kind of like, when I was listening to that on the radio, that was kind of hit a, hit a note with me. And I wonder whether to combat some of the, um, the media, uh, the, the more things like that can be sort of, uh, I don't know, sort of uh, worked on, because that sort of resonates with young people more, I guess. So essentially, it's social media. Um, I want to preface my comment by mentioning that uh, I had the privilege of being an instructor on what, as far as I know, was the first um, 
Islamic academy that was taught uh, over the internet, the first online Islamic academy. Um, I think uh, things such as hashtags and, uh, and social media, um, they're one of the tools in our repertoire, but honestly, uh, they're virtually a tool. You know, I think um, the internet, it reaches a lot of people, but in terms of the depth um, of its reach, I think that it's, uh, it's quite superficial. Um, and I say that, you know, I meet students that I've only interacted with uh, online versus students that I interact with um, face to face. And then also, um, I think because of the, the, the anonymous nature of the internet, um, you know, ultimately you don't really know who you're speaking to. So it's very easy for someone to manipulate something like a hashtag. Um, uh, I, th I believe what's more important is that we actually have things like this where there's human contact. <laughs> so I would say that um, while it's, uh, it, it touches certain people and, and, and does have a, a, an impact um, over the web, for instance, for the young Muslims uh, and brothers and sisters who are present, um, it's very important that they uh, make the da'wah of their prophet um, the outreach that their prophet brought and actually meet people of other faith communities and, um, and also uh, fellowship with those members of our own faith community who have embraced Islam. And um, if they do that, for instance, like we have a young man, uh, Bradley Brennan, um, probably of, of you know, Irish American origin based on his name, who's a convert to Islam. Uh, his fa both of his parents are, are, are Christian, um, you know, they're, they're from the Christian faith community, and uh, he's married to a sister who's Afghan, and he regularly attends our gatherings. Um, so people that attend our lessons semi-regularly interact with his, her, his father and mother and brothers and sisters. Um, and then also by virtue of that marriage, there was, a, you, know, uh, you know, literally a, a bond of kinship uh, that was formed between the two extended families and they all came together at the wedding. I think interaction like that is more important. So that rather than just hearing, you know, the Muslim brother is not like that, meaning the maniac who stabs someone, people actually shake hands with a Muslim who's not like that um, and meet them and break bread with them and really get to know them and um, see how Muslims really are, uh, particularly when that um, uh, is, is also um, combined with the element that Sheikh Yahya referenced as did Amir of education, that the Muslim community actually has a meaningful, deep education that connects them to their Prophet Wasallam. So when they interact with the rest of the society, they're actual ambassadors of Prophet Muhammad. That will, I believe that will do more uh, to remove those barriers than, than social media. We might use social media, but again, I think it's a, a relatively weak and easily manipulated tool. Um, and also, you know, one, uh, one power outage, and it's not working. So, we'll love that. Thank you for that. I mean, it's, uh, just to expand on that, we often get accused as Muslims that uh, we don't condemn some acts that take place. Uh, although we do, but we often, you know, get, you know, it's actually the hashtag like not in my name. Uh, you know, so they get used and we get accused. But I think, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you hit the right note. We I as say Muslims. Say can I say something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to say that in terms of this interaction, and I, I think I said this earlier as well, particularly uh, our members of our Muslim community who work with non-Muslim, uh, uh, people of other faith or no faith, that we've got to start talking to them. I mean, there was a period of time uh, when I was young, uh, our mosques were basically uh, not open for not because a lot of our elders in those times did not have... Uh, the communication skills to talk to other people about our beautiful religion. Nowadays, we've got third, fourth generation Muslims, and we've got no excuses whatsoever. So I think the message is a very important message that we've got to start interacting, we've got to start communicating with people, talking to them, so they don't get brainwashed by what happens on social media, in some of the popular media that we read day and night, because we've got to start talking to our neighbors, our colleagues, uh, peers, uh, and to create better understanding, to make a better society for us all. Any other question, please? Yeah, well, I'll go to the lady then, I'll come back to you. 
Yeah, hello, I'm Norton Irish. I know all about discrimination. And I know about how difficult it is when one society looks at you with suspicion. I'm a head teacher of a church school. I would like to invite the Peterborough community to come to our church school, to come and talk to our children and our community, because I know from my upbringing that talking here, a lot of people will be already on the same wavelength as you are. I think you need to come into the communities where they are, they don't know, and I think it's a lack of knowledge that causes suspicion as much as anything else. Thank you. And I thought about, in my mind, there's, there's various steps to it, and I appreciate your comment very much so. And in my mind, I, I've thought about different steps, and it seems to me to be, there's demonization, then there's humanization, then there's normalization, and then there's appreciation. And um, I think a lot of what we end up having to do is kind of put out the fires of demonization, and I think that demonization is a very, very difficult thing and that manipulating people's fears for whatever motives I think is a very dangerous human thing. And that I think that we all, as human beings, need to get beyond demonization on whatever side that it, that it is. And that move towards that you know, humanization, then eventually normalization, and finally appreciation. And I think that's, that's really the direction but, but oftentimes that there are people kind of stuck at various levels of that, and that there's techniques that have to be used in order to, to reach this point where that there's you know, appreciation of, of different backgrounds and different ways of thinking and different ways of being. Well, um, agreeing with your point on the media, I think anyone who's ever watched a news story that they, they know something about, you've always got questions with the coverage. You, you know, if it's a subject you know about and you see it on the news, it's not quite like that, or it, it's not that. But then we, we tend to watch the rest of the news that we don't know about and accept it as truth. Um, I think that's a problem everybody has to face. Also with social media, um, in my job as a police, um, again, someone who is mis misunderstood sometimes, we, we worry with the danger of social media. We see the, um, the vulnerability of people, and, and, and not just in relation to terrorism, but sexual exploitation, everything. There's a lot of predators out there. What, what can we do um, as a police force um, to engage and break down the, the barriers of mistrust that we have against us? Um, and how can we approach young Muslims and, and gain their trust and try and help them from a safeguarding point of view? Yeah. Um, just, just real briefly on that, and I'll pass it on to, to um, you know, to me, if I kind of take an example of that when I enter into a country, that if I go into a country and People are very menacing, frowny, very rude. As a human being, I don't feel like cooperating. Human beings are like that. If you go to someone and they're very kind, and they're there, they have a protocol, they're doing their job, and they don't have to necessarily smile from beginning to end, but they treat you right. You'll open up as a human being. Uh, so to me, that, that I, I think that um, you know, there's times where we have to stand for justice, but even when we stand for justice, there has to be an underlying mercy in our heart for everyone. And a, a, tr a treatment of human beings as human beings. And to me, I think we would be really surprised on what we get from other people that when we treat them well. Now, it's not always a guarantee, but I think that is one practical thing that if we can keep that in mind, um, that, that could really help, and I'm sure there's other uh, dimensions as well. I just wanted to comment that uh, you mentioned that that you know police are getting demonized right now, and I actually I don't I probably couldn't say this in certain segments of the African American community, but I feel sorry for police in the United States right now, um, and I say that also because you know as an African American man or as a Muslim man, 
you know, I'm constantly demonized, or been are my people, and, and now we have been are, are constantly being demonized. Um, so I feel for the, uh, the police officers that you know, um, I've been stopped a few times speeding or whatever in the last couple of years. You know, rush around the programs a lot. Most of them have let me off. You know, and and that's as dressed just like how, how I am. So, um, you know, that's not by by no means all police officers. How do we bridge those gaps? Um, I think what you what you're doing today is really um, the foundation. You know, being someone who extends your hand to another community, and I would say uh, find those elements in the Muslim community that also are people of reason and good character. And I think those of us of reason of, of any two communities that are trying to fight off the harm of the unreasonable elements of our two communities, uh, the two people of reason have to come together and cooperate to stave off the harm of the unreasonable elements. So just if you've extended your hand, try to find members of the Muslim community that extend theirs, uh, and that there be more interaction and uh, mutual understanding, as Sheikh Yaqin mentioned, so that there's some of, something of the humanization uh, of, of each side. And I believe that's a first step. And then uh, tension goes a long, long way. You know, having that, that intention and you know humbly coming is probably for you coming in. You know, there's young Muslims and what have you. You're, you, you're, you're coming into maybe unfamiliar territory. To territory. Thank you for coming. You know, thank you for coming, and let's make sure that we shake hands before you uh, depart. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, we'll mention something. Just a moment. Is, is it okay? Can I, can I just comment on? Uh, please. please. Oh, we're running it's, short of time, but please do. So, yeah. Um, uh, profiling is something really, really real. I'm not sure if your department particularly does it or not, but profiling is, is very real, and it has very real consequences in 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 in, 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 in mistrust. Um, um, I I know that. I know for a fact that the two gentlemen you see in front of you from the United States, when they fly back to the United States, they're always given a hard time. Every <coughs> single time. And, and the thing is, the thing is, if any of these two wanted to do something harm, that is probably not the disguise they would use. <laughs> but profiling is very real, and it, it has very real consequences of building mistrust. So I would heavily, heavily, heavily caution against that. Thank you very much, Patrick. Again, Dr. Ecker, on behalf of everybody, many thanks for your beautiful presentation. It's been really delightful. Uh, again, and also to echo uh, our <laughs> lovely ladies coming here about uh, the fact that all the majority of edu educationalists and intellectuals are on the same wavelength. You know, uh, we have m the moral intelligence, I say, to understand the right from wrong. And we all understand and appreciate the fact that. Obviously, people from uh, people of uh, uh, extreme, you know, uh, in all faiths have no obviously room, no association with any faith at all. But I mean, what practical advice you would give our young students, young young folk here, you know, how they should deal with their peers, you know, with, with their friends, with their colleagues at work, etc., in, in, in actually eradicating those misconceptions and myths. Specifically, uh, what misconceptions and myths are you referring to? I mean, in terms of associating Muslims with ISIS and extremism. So you're saying uh, the young people when, who interact with um, people of other faith communities, how do they uh, remove those misconceptions? That's right, yes. Through their behavior, through their conduct. Yeah, um, I want to mention two comments. One, that when we talk about education, um, when, when, when my peers and I talk about education, we're not uh, merely referring to something ac academic. Um, that's one component of education, but we're refer referring to really uh, developing the human spirit or nurturing the human spirit. Um, and for many of us, especially for communities that have uh, um, challenges, uh, disenfranchised young people, for instance, that entails healing wounds that exist in their heart and soul and mind. Um, so. I would say that uh, first of all, or actually I'd say to myself first and foremost, and to each of you as present, you know, each of us has to um, you know, reconcile certain things within our spirit and our heart, uh, in my belief, between us and the divine. Um, so those young Muslims, particularly who are present, need to connect to sound education. Um, you know, for me, there were things in my humanity that I felt had been damaged. Um, coming through the environment that I lived in as a, as a young man, in, uh, as a teenager, 
where there's a lot of drugs, there's a lot of promiscuity, there's a whole lot of violence. I don't know if you all know about the 80s in, in, North, in America, but with the epidemic of crack cocaine, you know, young people I went to elementary school with died in that, uh, both males and females. So there's a lot, there were a lot of scars that needed to be healed, you know. And at that point in time, um, in my early Islam, had I been picked up by the wrong type of groups, I, some of that pain uh, could have been directed um, you know, in the wrong direction. But fortunately, I was connected to educators who I feel help, are helping me heal things in my spirit that need to be healed. So I can't, uh, I can't um, emphasize that enough. Um, people that help you love Allah and His Messenger, uh, who is the prophet of mercy, and show you that mercy and love. And um, they're not perhaps the loudest voices, but they do exist. So that would be one. And then two, I would say, uh, working yourself to embody those um, principles and demonstrate them in your interaction with peers, um, whether they be of your same faith community or other faith communities. But you try to uh, be Muhammadan, as we said. You try to learn about the deen of Muhammad and, uh, and, and emulate him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then your um, beautiful representation of his message, uh, that's the best refutation of those misconceptions. Thank you very much. We're running short of time. Last question from a sister here. Um, it's not actually my question, it's from one of the sisters who was a student of this group, I think. Um, but the question is, you spoke about the grounding elements of the religion, and at the same time we're talking about the context that we're living in. For young people who are living in, it's not just here in Britain or even in the West, just generally in the modern world, it can be quite difficult to ho keep holding on to those grounding elements when you're, on the one hand, you've got distractions uh, from just the modern world in general, but also You've got things, elements from within our religion that are doing awful things in the name of our religion. Both of those things can be pushing you away from the faith. So how do you hold on to those grounding elements? So that is a, a very, very good question. And probably, you know, within our Muslim community is one of the most pertinent questions. Um, I think the first thing is to realize is that it is possible. The first thing to realize is that it is possible. And um, if you uh, have a defeated mentality, there have done scientific studies that show that, that, that you won't succeed in whatever it is that you're doing if you come to the table with a defeated mentality that it's not possible. First of all, know that it is possible. The proof that it is possible is that God joined between spirit and flesh in one body, synthesized, that simultaneously we have a spirit and we have a physical body, which are opposites, but they're together. And if we can synthesize spirit and body, we can indeed synthesize that our Islamic identity, using that word identity loosely, with that our identity of being a British Muslim or a world citizen or whatever it might be. So it is very possible. And that, is it easy? Always? No. Relative to a person's circumstances, that it might be difficult. But I believe that that if someone in t makes the intention and puts him or herself in the proper situation whereby that they learn and they become educated, I believe is that the key is education. And what we mean by education here, again, is that a broad, holistic type of education that touches your mind, body, and soul. Iman, Islam, and Ihsan. All these dimensions of the human being. Because I can say, honestly, from the bounty of God, when I hear about these things that happen, is that, yes, that I'm hurt by them, which we should be, because we care about humanity. At the same time, that from the bounty of God, they don't, that cause me doubt in my faith, you see? That the more and more that you learn about the modern world, and the more and more that you study about the way that things work, which is important for a Muslim to be aware of their time. The more and more that you're grounded in your own traditions, that you can understand all of that means. You have a place to, that if you will, that organize the various things that you're, you're exposed to. So it is possible, but it does require a little bit of effort. And that if you make the intention and put in that effort, and increasingly that we have beautiful examples of leadership that are rising that you have people like Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad at the University of Cambridge, you have people like Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah that who is in the United States of America, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, Imam Zaid Shakur, and these are just a few names and there are many, many more, that Sheikh Noah Keller, that have a plethora of articles and talks and that everything that they're saying is 
creating this synthesis, that if we open our mind to it, as well as some of the great uh, other teachers from the East as well that, that also are, are helping take part in this. So once we realize that it's possible, it's just about that putting yourself in an environment of education, allowing that synthesis to take place, and that when it happens, then you, you, you will be grounded. And um, that you could, should never forget the devotional aspect of that, which is turning to God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in all of your different states. And that's perhaps one of the most important dimensions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you may have other questions as well, but I'm sorry that we have run out of time.